Council committee of the whole meeting to order. Then his roll call. Um, Boren. Excused. Bauk. Excused. Bowers. Excused. Decker. Here. Yesha. Here. Hammond. Here. Hannah. Excused. Heideman. Excused. Koth. Here. Yay. Kittleson. Excused. Montemayor. Here. Radke. Here. Rinfleisch. Here. Vanderweel. Here. Versi. Here. And Wangaman. Excused. Exactly what we need, nine. By the skin of our teeth, we can meet. Um, next, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next, we're looking for approval of the previous minutes, the last committee of the whole meeting uh, so the previous. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. All in favor of that motion approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. This is the first of hopefully um, numerous Committee of the Whole meetings. Uh, my goal, as stated uh, on our opening Common Council meeting, was to have these as informative, uh, but also to be the body where uh, open uh, discussion and debate can occur um, in a more relaxed atmosphere than perhaps Common Council uh, would be. Um, the, uh, there are several items, I think, that will be coming up shortly. Uh, but before we get to that, I thought it was important, uh, as, with, as well as many other uh, council members, that we had an introduction for uh, not only the new uh, alderpersons, um, which we'll, we'll have more in depth tomorrow, I understand, but also for the returning alderpersons, kind of a review of um, um, some of the responsibilities uh, and duties and ethics of our, our, our position. So with that, we have... Um, uh, Two people actually speaking today, correct? We don't, don't have Dan today. Uh, and that would be uh, City Clerk Sue Richards and City Attorney Steve McLean. Thank you both for uh, speaking to us today. And I guess, Sue, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, well, it's going to be relaxed. I'm going to just kind of go through. Well, Jim, not that relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to go through some things um, that are more procedural things that I went through and I thought about the things that we run into that we seem to have, not issues, but just questions about on a pretty regular basis. Um, I gave you a packet with some of the things that we're gonna just touch on. Just stop me if you have a question. I know that I sometimes come off as really pushing you and really making you hold the line, but it's really important. And I'm trying to keep everybody on track with what we need to do as a city. So forgive me if it sounds like I'm really a, a taskmaster, but that's my job. Um, one of the first things, this is what's going on. One of the first things that is very important for this council is dealing with all the agendas and minutes. Um, you may think that if you belong to one or two committees, or that's all there is. We have probably over 55, 58 committees now. <coughs> there, even though they all don't meet every single week, they do meet throughout the year, and we get agendas and minutes flowing into the office constantly, as you can tell by your emails that I send you. Um, it's very important. I'm the one that keeps track of all of the agendas and minutes. It has to be one person so we can make sure that we are doing our legal responsibility of posting them, or you can't have your meeting if you don't have it posted properly. Um, it's important by our municipal code that we have all the minutes in a certain amount of time, which we'll go through in a second. What I would ask is that your agendas and your minutes should all be sent to me electronically. Um, what we do is we distribute them. We don't write the agendas, we don't write the minutes, unless it's for the council. That's the only minutes in the, in the agenda that I write. So you're gonna have parent uh, departments that work with you, like Public Works for the Public Works Department, et cetera, that will work with you if you're a chairman of a different committee. <clears throat> um, I take care of all the posting, whether it be actual physical posting of the agendas, and I also distribute them to the different groups. All the media get them, which is required. We have a distribution list of the public, 
a large di distribution list of the public. And then we have an internal list, and then we have the aldermanic list. So you all get this. On a, like I said, I don't wait till the end of the week. I do it as I get them in, because sometimes people need to have that ahead of time to schedule. So you will be getting them pretty regularly. I do split them up between minutes and agendas. You'll notice you'll get two, usually, emails from me. So that's what that is. Um, another really important thing, and I'm a real stickler on this, is that we need to have the agendas to me at least 24 hours before you're planning your meeting. If it's not before 24 hours, I've been known to stop meetings. I'll come up and say, look, you didn't post it in, with enough time, and it's all to do with the public having the right to be there, having the right to be noticed for your meeting. So it, the one thing that I would ask is that you give me at least an hour, maybe two before that 24-hour period, because if you send it to me a minute before the 24 hours, I might not be at my desk. I'm not sitting there looking at the emails all day long, just waiting for you to send me something, even though that would be fun, but I don't do that. So if you can send it an hour or two, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, as far as the minutes go, this has been a real stickler. <laughs> And we do have a lot of people that call me and say the minutes aren't there yet. And they may have waited a month or two months or three months and they want to know what happened. Um, we have it in our municipal code. You have to, and I'm saying you collectively, whoever is responsible for the minutes has to get them to me within 96 hours of that meeting. That way I can get them posted on the website. I email them out to everybody, the media, etc. cetera. Um, I realize that it's hard sometimes, but three months later is probably not a wise idea. It's going against our code. You know, you have to do your very best to get it to me as soon as you possibly can. And everybody's really picking up the pace. I'm getting them within, you know, 10 hours of the meeting. It's really getting better. So I must really be cracking the whip. Um, the other thing that I've had to um, put in place is a deadline for when the council documents come in. Um, I know that you probably think, well, why does she have to have them in at this point? The meeting's not till next Monday. But what you have to understand is there's a process that, that we have to take, that I have to do with the agenda, or with the documents, rather, get them written, get them processed. You know, it's a pretty laborious process, whether we're doing it on the paper version or even if, you know, when we go to the electronic version, it's still going to be a laborious process as far as getting everything in. So that's why there's a deadline midweek where I need to have the documents so that I can get them written, write an agenda, and make sure you have them by the weekend. So if you ever wonder why is she pulling them so fast. Now, there are always exceptions to the rule. Some committees meet after my deadline. I'm not going to tell them, no, you can't get your documents in, but they're kind enough to get them in immediately after the meeting, and I can still get them on. So stop me if you have any questions. Um, your packs, you all know they're already usually on Friday. They always are up here. The only time that they wouldn't be ready on Friday, there's occasions during the year that I'll be gone either to conferences or whatever, and I'm not back till late Friday. I start writing the documents on Saturday. We run them, and I usually have them done by Sunday. Um, so we would email you and say, your packets will be ready Sunday after 5. And that doesn't happen very often, but it does happen on occasion. Most of the time, you'll be able to pick them up on Friday or over the weekend. And you can get in with your key fob all weekend long after hours. OK? Um, the other thing that we sometimes get questioned on is when you get calls from your constituents and they are um, telling you something's wrong, I need help with this, or whatever it is, I would ask that you, you know, when you're talking, trying to solve the problem with them, if, if it's something that you know that you just can't pass on, it's a real easy situation that you could call public works or whatever, ask them to put it in writing so that they can submit it or you can submit it to me so we have a paper trail, some kind of a trail that they've actually registered a complaint with you so that we follow up on it. Otherwise, sometimes they get lost in the shuffle, and I hate to see that happen. It's easier if you as an alderman don't say it for them, have them put it in writing or email, and just email it to me. That we find is really the best way to handle it. Um, and if you, you know, if you get to an email or any kind of letter over the weekend right before council <coughs> meeting, just fire it over to me and I'll do it on Monday morning. That would be great. I gave you some websites where you can, I'm sure all of you have been on. One of them is our city website. The county's website is there. Um, our municipal code, which are all of our laws, are on our city's website. You can link right to it. Um, on your desks, you may not all have them right now, but there is a 
cheat sheet. It's a laminated sheet that tells you how to do all the motions so that when you're standing up here and we're all looking at you and you say, oh my gosh, how do I do this? I always have that cheat sheet in front of you. So you will all have that. The new alderman will have it. So if you want to make a motion to pass a resolution, the wording will be theirs. Okay? Um, in the packet that I gave you, these are just some things that are real helpful. We've got the most current automatic list with all the emails, addresses, and phone numbers. Current as of, I think Dennis, you were the last one to change something. We've changed that, so it's current as of right now. <laughs> and anytime something changes, if your phone number changes, email changes, please let us know, and then we'll resend these out to you, okay? I've given you a current list of the standing committees. I've given you a current phone list of all the internal people in the city. So if you need to get a hold of Dave Beeble in Public Works, he's going to be on here. So you don't have to, not that I don't want to hear from you, but you don't have to call me and say, how do I get a hold of this? And some of you like to call directly to the department. So I've given you that. There's a sheet in here on um, just some helpful hints as far as procedures starting the council meeting. It starts at 7. You need to be here early to sign documents. Anytime after 6.30 would be great. Don't show up at 5 to 7. No. If a document needs to be signed and, and the mayor pounds the gavel and the document's not signed in on my desk, it can't get acted on. You know, it's not my rule, it's the way it is. So that's why you're always here us saying, you've got documents out there, we need them. Um, and basically, I've just given you a summary of the different things that we have, the different documents. There's five different types of documents. Those I'm not going to go through now. I'm going to spend some time with our new older persons next week, and we'll go through that so that you understand a little bit more about how the documents work. I also have the full complete as of today, the committee listing for you, because that changes sometimes. People are added, people resign. This is the most current. It will be on the website, and that will change as we get any changes. The last thing that I would say is, I think most of you, you all should have this, except for the new old person. I think Scott has this. Um, there's a book that the League of Municipalities puts out that I purchase um, to have on hand. I think most of you have been issued one of these. This is one of the most valuable resources for an official. It is, it's called the Handbook of, um, for Wisconsin Municipal, Municipal Officials. It is everything you ever wanted to know about being an older person, everything from annexations to financing to everything you want to know. Use this as your resource. You have all of your department heads and your departments to use as resource. This is a fantastic resource. And your new alderman, you'll be getting it next week when we meet. So this is something. And really, if you have any questions, you know, we learn as we are going on. And I'm sure you know that as you go through meetings, especially the new alder persons, as you go through every meeting, you learn more about how things work. So don't panic that you think, oh my gosh, I don't know everything. It takes people six months or more year just to figure out what the process is. So don't panic if you don't know it. We understand, and we're always here to help. So that's it for me. Questions? Thank you, Sue. So any questions? Alderman Gisha. Uh, thank you, Chairman Reinfeldt. Sue, I, as far as your department goes and questions <coughs> regarding old documents or research in your department, can maybe you address how you'd like that handled? Um, well, we are the keeper of the records for the city, basically. We have all, all, all the council documents dating back to the 1800s. We have all the minutes books. So if there is something that it's an easy find, something that's within the last six months or a year or two years, and you need to find it, um, you can give us a call and we will dig it out for you. I can scan it and email it to you. If it's a little bit more lengthy process, I'd ask that you just give us some time. You know, we don't have that many people there and we're, you know, we're usually pretty busy and we would just do some research and that will take just a little bit longer. But we do have all the books there, the minutes books and all the council documents, most of the contracts with the city. Between our office and the attorney's office, we have, I would hope, all of the contracts with the city, that the city has, so. So we're kind of your resource place for that. Um, citizen, I do see the um, your request to speak right now. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, on the agenda, I did not actually post public comments today. I don't want to comment. I want to ask a question. And unfortunately, <laughs> I did not do so either. <laughs> I will add that next time. If perhaps you want to lean over to an alderman, and maybe that alder person would be so kind to. But unfortunately, I, I don't have that on the agenda to, to, for public input. My apologies. Any other questions this time? 
All right, we'll move on. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Just a show. final question, Sue. That in, uh, if an older person wishes to write a resolution uh, and doesn't know how. Right. That's a really good question. Um, we get a lot of calls for, I need to write a resolution, I need to put an ordinance in, how do I do that? Between our office and the city attorney's office, we can guide you. We're not going to write, you're gonna to have to write what you want, you know, the, the, the part of that, but I think that we can give you the procedure on how to do it, send you samples of ordinances and resolutions. You should always, always have the city attorney check the ordinance and the resolution if possible to see if it's in proper legalese. I would hate to have a document come through and all of a sudden we've got to move it out because it's not proper. Just check with the city attorney before it comes in. Would be a really good idea, but we can help with that. Okay, Mayor Rob. Yes, yeah, so if, I, if I can just comment, please. Um, both uh, Sue Richards and Steve McLean are, are invaluable resources that are available. And if you ever have a doubt, um, about uh, writing an ordinance or about uh, which I believe are going to be discussing ethics up here. Um, do not be afraid to call them. If you're ever in doubt, you're better off calling the resource and getting a straight answer than you are winging it. So, I mean, I've, I've uh, you know, in my four years around here, I guarantee you that uh, Sue and Steve have probably seen me more than they want to. Um, but uh, you, you know they are they are a resource of the city, and I, I would urge everybody to use them. Any other questions this time? All right, we'll move on to uh, City Attorney Steve McLean. Uh, thanks, sir. I just uh, want to on the discussion of uh, drafting ordinances. I know the issues come up with the uh, Alderman Versi already. Uh, I guess. But I can do that. Based on my experience, what I, generally, if it's a rather complicated ordinance or somewhat major, uh, I guess my preference is rather than our office drafting something complete uh, up front, uh, generally I, I, my advice is to run something through a committee that deals with that issue and see what the sentiment of the committee is as to uh, whether there's more than just one individual wanting to uh, pursue that legislation or would support it. Uh, I found uh, there's a number of documents uh, that spent a lot of time on, on ordinances that really didn't go anywhere. And I mean, I don't really mind doing that so much, but it's certainly a lot easier and more uh, efficient for our office if if the subject is broached at the particular committee of jurisdiction over that subject and the committee says, uh, uh, yeah, have the city attorney you know, work with you and draft something up and bring it in. At least then I have some feeling that there's more than just one individual that has an interest in this and uh, it might have some legs uh, so that our office's time can be used most efficiently. Uh, you know, there. There are times when, if, if it's not a real uh, sort of involved thing, uh, we don't have a problem drafting it up right from scratch, but uh, uh, some fairly complicated things that where there are a lot of issues or uh, there are policy questions as to what's to be included and what's not, I get some guidance or feel from more than just one alderman say, uh, before we draft it up and go to that time, it, it's helpful, I think, and I, th I think it's probably more productive for the council, too. Uh, Mr. McLean, if I may. Um, so in committee, uh, it would be appropriate then to say, based on our, our discussions, uh, we make a motion to direct the city attorney to write a resolution with these points. That's fine. And at least then we know that's been passed by the majority of the committee. Yeah, or we're even not wasting his time. Or though. even you know, wouldn't even need to direct our office. Just uh, if we got some indication that there's some sentiment okay. for that subject matter, because uh, uh, you know, I spend a fair amount of time drafting that stuff, and uh, if it's not going to go anywhere, it's really not productive. All right, thank you. Uh, as far as my understanding is, we're meeting with. Sue and I and uh, I think Alderman Gish are meeting with the, the three new aldermen on Tuesday at noon. I guess what I, what I intend to cover at that uh, meeting with the new aldermen is uh, a couple of things that I'm not going to talk about tonight. Uh, 
what I view as really sort of an orientation, the big picture of what an alderman is, uh, what your authority is under the statutes as an alderman, what the authority of the city council is, um, what the, talk about legislative procedure, um, how you, uh, you get uh, documents passed and whether you use an ordinance or a resolution or sometimes you need a charter ordinance and what the difference is, and whether you need a majority vote or a, a, a super majority, a two thirds vote, um, sort of quorum issues. Um, I'll be talking about a little bit about parliamentary procedure, agendas, um, the ch charter law of municipalities, how uh, in the old days, every city in the state, or most of them, had special charters that were just specifically for them, and how uh, the legislature did away with the special charters in the early 1900s and went to a general charter law and kind of cover what's in the general charter law. Home rule authority, what authority a, a city has to enact legislation, um, how, uh, what sort of scopes of topics you can uh, pass legislation on and whether it conflicts with state law or doesn't conflict with state law and things like that. Classes of cities, we're a second class city and talk about what's the difference between a first class city and I should say we're a, cla a city of the second class. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> uh, we're striving to be a first class city. Yeah. Uh, um, We'll be talking about uh, one st statute that uh, deals with general municipal law, chapter 66 of the statutes, so kind of a uh, brief overview as to what's in there, types of things that uh, cities deal with. Uh, and I'll also spend a little bit of time on uh, municipal and personal liability under Wisconsin law. I think it's important for aldermen to know uh, if they're hanging out to dry personally uh, on actions that they may take or not take uh, as opposed to when the city uh, is obligated or may indemnify individual aldermen for actions that they take or don't take and what scenarios that apply. So uh, <coughs> that's what I'll cover with the new alderman next week. Um, tonight I thought Really there's, uh, in uh, my experience, sort of three big core subjects that aldermen deal with that are non-substantive uh, matters as far as uh, legislative type things, but there are three important areas for aldermen to be aware of. Uh, one is the open meeting law, one is the public records law, and one is the ethics laws and our ethics code. Uh, interestingly enough, they're all addressed in Chapter 19 of the state statutes. Um, uh, I thought tonight, if, uh, if, it, if you're willing, I'd talk about the open meeting law. Uh, I could spend hours on this, and I'm sure you'd all like to stay here for hours and listen to this. But uh, uh, I think I'd talk about the open meeting law tonight and perhaps at some future date we'll get an opportunity to talk about the public records laws. Uh, public records laws don't, you know, aldermen don't deal as directly with the public records laws as they do with the open meetings law. Uh, although I will say as a caveat, if, if you've got a home computer and you're doing work, city work at home um, and you're getting emails and so forth, those sorts of things become public records and you've got an obligation under the law to uh, retain those. You can't just delete all these uh, emails and, and uh, various documents you get. Uh, question? We have a question. <laughs> I get emails, I apologize for interrupting, thank you uh, Chairperson Renflish, but I get emails all the time from constituents. Do we have to save all those too? I mean, what's um, the, you know, I don't like this, I don't like that, uh, this, that. I mean, do we need to save all of those? Uh, I would say yes. Yes, you should. What's that? All righty. <laughs> should be saving that stuff. Okay. The general, I have been, but I didn't know what The general presumption is uh, 
anything's really a public record unless it's personal notes. Uh, if, uh, if it's generated sort of and covers the scope of your authority or scope of, scope of your duties as an alderman, um, and you need to preserve those things uh, generally, the general rule is for six years. Um, there are certain things like, uh, you know, you get uh, what I would say would be equivalent to a phone message or something like that on a pink slip where, you know, you got a call from somebody and uh, I would view the electronic version of that no different than the hard copy and that's, that's not really a public record. That's, uh, you get junk mail, that's, uh, you get spam, that, that's not public record, but uh, communications uh, between you and constituents, communications between you and uh, city officials, other aldermen, that uh, you should really be keeping because uh, the public can make requests for that information. Uh, some of that stuff may be uh, not accessible to the public for various, uh, various reasons, maybe confidential or uh, uh, may not be available, but uh, in general, I think it's a good idea to save that, that material. Uh, so getting, if I can, shift in gears to uh, the open meeting law. Looks like we have one more question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Steve, how about telephone calls? When they call and ask me a question, I give them an answer. Yeah, you got to save those. <laughs> <laughs> no, the good thing about the telephone <coughs> is real it, it, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't stay there forever. It's not a okay. document. Uh, no, you don't have to, obviously, telephone call is a telephone call. Um, a lot of times it, from uh, a government employee's or government official standpoint, the telephone is uh, often a lot easier and more convenient because of the fact that you don't get this paper trail and then you have to worry about whether you got to keep it or you don't have to keep it. Uh, so the phone can be very helpful uh, uh, as opposed to doing a lot of business by email. Although, you know, I'm old school enough where I generally prefer the telephone versus uh, a lot of emails and things like that. It's easier for me, but I know the, uh, you know, younger alderman and stuff, uh, you're grew up on email and instant messaging and text messaging and all that stuff, but all that creates uh, records. They're, they're there, uh, even on electronic format, and they're uh, potentially subject to the public records law. Uh, I guess the, the, to interrupt again, I think the public should be aware too that when they communicate with us, especially by email, they're creating a public record. Uh, that there should not be any expectation of anonymity or, or privacy when communicating even through email uh, for the public's sake as well. Uh, so you may get some, a comment like, this is just for your benefit. I want you to vote yes on this, but don't tell anybody that I said that. Be aware, that's a, that's a document that's been created if they email it to you, especially and, and a letter too. Correct? Right. Okay. Um, I haven't seen a lot of requests, but uh, we've had uh, the mayor had uh, an open records request from the Sheboygan Press for six months worth of emails. Uh, you know, sent, received, whatever. Uh, and we spent a long time going through them. Uh, I think there was about 6,000. And... Uh, you don't use email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of those were sent, to, sent to the mayor, but the, uh, he's got them. They're on his in his computer, they create a record there. Um. Steve, I, I was the, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, I received a couple open records requests a year or so ago from, uh, from one of the labor unions and produced what they asked for. And uh, can you charge people for producing this stuff? Yeah. And, and what happens if you produce it and they never pick it up? Um, well, I guess let's forget open meetings. We'll talk about public <laughs> records. I was trying uh, to do a segue. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, the uh, 
the concept with public records is uh, rather documents maintained by an authority. And the statute defines authority to include individual uh, elected or appointed officials. So records you maintain uh, that are your records are your public records. If you get stuff from the council meetings, take them home, uh, they're, they're records, although most of that stuff would be at the city clerk's office, and the city clerk is really the primary uh, repository of the official public records. You just got a copy. Um, but if, if you have that in your possession and somebody makes a request for it, uh, they got a right to get a copy. Uh, can you charge for that? Yes. Uh, the, uh, the standard is that you can charge your reasonable costs of uh, reproduction. Uh, and we've applied in the city uh, uh, that at 25 cents a page generally. Um, I guess what I would suggest and advise all the aldermen, if you get any open records requests, contact our office and we'll help you through it. I think that's the best way to go. Uh, some things you may have may not be a record. Um, some things you may be get, you get asked. A lot of times you'll get requests from uh, individuals or citizens groups to answer a list of questions. And they're citing the Freedom, uh, Freedom of Information Act or the federal law or the state open uh, public records law. You're not obligated to answer questions under the public records law. If you've got a record, you've got perhaps an obligation to provide, make that available to the public. But you don't have to start, uh, you know, doing a lot of research and answering questions and things like that. That's, it's strictly a matter of if you got the record uh, and it's deemed to be public and there's no reason why it's confidential or excluded as an exception to the public records law, uh, you've got to make it available. Now, you don't necessarily have to copy it, and, and a lot of times what I do, I've had requests uh, from other attorneys. They make open records requests for a whole bunch of uh, files in our office. Uh, I have oftentimes called up the attorney and said, look, uh, you know, I'll dig out all the files that are relevant to your request. I'll have them on my conference room table and you can come in anytime during the working hours and look through them to your heart's content. If you want to make copies of anything, you're free to do that, uh, and we'll charge you for whatever you want copied. That, uh, from my perspective, is often very effective. It saves, saves a lot of time and, and needless copy and stuff that nobody's really interested in, in anyway, and, and frankly, uh, it puts the burden on the requester to to really look through and see what the, what it is, if anything, they're interested in. Uh, um, there are. <clears throat> what else can I tell you about public records? Um, you you have the right to, if you do produce a copy. Uh, basically, twenty five cents is the. It's the standard. You generally don't have the right to uh, charge, uh, you know, your time, if you will, spent in making the copies and things like that. That's all sort of deemed to be within the 25 cents uh, that we use as, as a general rule. Um, under the public records law, <coughs> if somebody makes a verbal request, uh, they can't sue you if you don't respond. In order for them to pursue anything, to sue you later on, their request needs to be in writing, and writing can also be email. <clears throat> if somebody does make a written request to you or an email request for public records, uh, you gotta respond to it. You can't just blow them off and not respond. Uh, <clears throat> the courts hold that if you don't respond, basically, You've denied their request, and they got the right, if they wish to pursue it, to go to court and uh, 
and sue you under the public records law. Uh, you can't then argue to the judge that, well, if I had responded, I, I would have denied the request for this, this, and this reason. It's too late at that point. You have to, if you're going to deny a request, you got to indicate what your basis is for that denial up front. Uh, and there's a lot of case law on this uh, where, you know, you say, I'm not going to give it for this particular reason, and uh, the court deems that that's not a legitimate reason. There might have been another legitimate reason, but you didn't really deny it on that basis. The court's going to say you got to turn over the record. Um, Judge's question again. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How long from the time we get that open records request do we have to respond to it? Is there a statute time frame or do uh, we just the reasonable law amount is, of time? Uh, promptly within a reasonable period of time, uh, but but promptly. You can't just say, well, I'll get to it when I get to it and blow it off for, for a month or so. Generally, the Attorney General's office takes the position that uh, 10 days is a reasonable period of time. Um, and again, though, if you do get a request, contact the city attorney's office yeah, immediately. Yeah. Uh, I am not aware that much that aldermen get requests for open records or for uh, public records. I, I've seen it, but uh, typically they're looking for copies of our files or copies of records from the mayor or the city clerk or some city department. Uh, finance department, things like that, that uh, regularly generate a lot of paperwork dealing with the city. Um, but, and I advise all the departments too, generally when they get requests, unless it's pretty routine and unless they are confident they're just gonna give it and they've got it available for them to contact our office as well. Because uh, uh, there are, uh, you know, a lot of issues with the, the police chiefs here. Uh, the police department gets a lot of requests for uh, uh, police reports, internal police investigations, uh, some sort of sensitive matters uh, sometimes. And the news media is looking for them or somebody else for whatever reason. Um, and there may be... Uh, statutorily valid reasons not to provide those things. Uh, or there, there's also uh, many times if the record uh, makes reference to and the subject of the record is a city employee, uh, the law requires that before you release the record, you give the city employee notice and there's a statutory scheme for doing that. You gotta give them written notice and they've got 10 days to uh, to respond, you know, for instance, uh, I get a request and there's something in there that involves some city employee and uh, I make the determination that uh, it's subject to release. Uh, before I release that, I've got to give the employee notice and an opportunity to go to court and get a court order to stop that release. If I don't do that, I could be liable to the uh, employee for violating their privacy rights. Um, another thought came to me uh, and vanished immediately. Um, um, public records, again, the, uh, there's a lot of statutory exceptions, things that aren't public. I didn't really prepare that well for public records discussion tonight, but uh, I did bring the statute along to take a quick look here. Uh, trade secrets, these are limitations upon access. Uh, law enforcement records, certain law enforcement records are not subject to disclosure. Uh, contractors records, some of those are and some of those aren't. For instance, we get requests uh, where uh, DPW has a whole contract file with a contractor that's doing a street uh, street pavement work, and uh, you get requests from individuals or labor unions curious as to whether or not the contractor's pay, paying prevailing wages. 
Uh, a lot of that information we might not even have in our files, but there's the statutes talk about since they're contracting with the city that the uh, we've got to get those from the contractor and make them available in an open records request <coughs> with certain uh, you know deletions for names and social security numbers and that sort of thing. Um, a lot of personal information, health care records, uh, social security numbers. <coughs> often home telephone numbers and things like that can be redacted from records uh, before you release them. Uh, but like the open meeting law, uh, the general presumption is uh, it's subject to disclosure. There's, Wisconsin is very, uh, has very strong uh, laws uh, on public records and, and public meetings that the general strong presumption of the state is that uh, all these things are public and open and available to the citizens to find out uh, what's going on in the government and how things uh, are, uh, are managed in the government. Uh, and it's the, the restrictions are always pretty narrowly construed and there's what's called a balancing test in the public records law. Uh, if there's nothing that says it's uh, disclosable or not disclosable. The, uh, the custodian of the record, and that's what you are if it's your record and they're making a request to you. If, if it's your record, you're the custodian of the record. Uh, you engage in what's called the balancing test uh, and weigh the public's right to access to the record versus the harm to the public <coughs> in disclosing the record. And this comes up uh, uh, more frequently than you would think. I, I remember one sort of classic scenario it also involved the police department. There was a, uh, a number of years ago, uh, there was a shooting. Uh, police officer shot an individual on the south side who had uh, his wife, I believe, hostage and was threatening to kill her with a knife. And uh, that was the guy had been torturing his wife for a number of hours, and he had that all on video. And the police had the video, and the news media was interested in getting the video. And uh, it was a, it was a very gruesome CD, and the issue was whether or not the uh, uh, the benefit to the public in releasing that was outweighed by the harm to the public and, and, and the harm to the uh, privacy interests in disclosing that sort of thing. Uh, now another thing on public records is if you get a request and you're not the custodian of the record, you don't have that record. They're asking you for something you don't have. You don't have to generate a record to respond to them. And you don't have to say, well, uh, I don't have that, uh, you know, this other alderman's got that. Uh, you're only the custodian of what you've got. If they're making the request of you, your obligation is w with your documents, not with anybody else's. Uh, we're somewhat flexible, uh, sort of on a case-by-case -case basis in the city where uh, somebody will make a request to the finance director and uh, we know the finance director doesn't have the records, but the city clerk does. Sometimes we'll, you know, contact the city clerk. She'll make the records available and we'll respond to that. But uh, from a technical standpoint, the finance director could just respond and say, well, you know, I'm not the custodian of that record. I don't have it, uh, period. It doesn't have to say that, uh, you know, Sue Richards happens to have that record. You might want to contact her or I'll, go talk to Sue and get it from her. Uh, so it, it's a very uh, technical statute. It's, uh, again, it, it's part of the, uh, under the general theory in Wisconsin of open government, it's important to the public. Uh, the public's got a right to know these things, got a right to uh, uh, get copies of the stuff. But as I say, uh, it's not your job to generate responses to 
just questions. That's not to say that you can't do that, and very often uh, that may be the most practical thing to do. I know the uh, fire chief got a request earlier this week uh, from a group, and they asked a series of questions, and it was not yes or no, but it was they wanted numbers of this and numbers of that. And, uh, you know, I advised the chief, well, you don't have to answer the questions like that. Uh, you can tell them, you know, do you want a record? Uh, I, and I don't have a record that gives those numbers. I'd have to spend a bunch of time to compile that. Uh, but as a practical matter, if you want, you could go ahead and do a little uh, dig in in your files and respond to the questions. There's certain not, certainly nothing wrong with the answering those things, but uh, that's not a requirement of the public records law. Steve, if I may. Um, I know we're off of your prepared that's topics fine. right that's now. Fine. <laughs> fine. Um, the, the one topic I would like you to speak on, if possible, unless there's any questions before we move on to, uh, is it seems every year that I've been on since 2003, uh, the question of ethics of, you know, is that ethical behavior from an older person or not an ethical behavior from an older person? Um, I don't know if you're able to or if you prepared anything to discuss, yeah, I, you know, the, the ethics of, of our position here. Sure. Unless there's any other points someone else would bring up first. Okay. Um, the big picture is there's a state statute also, as I said, it's in Chapter 19, uh, that there is a code of ethics for local officials. Uh, well, code of Ethics for Local Government Officials, Employees, and Candidates, Chapter uh, 19, Section 19.59. And uh, in addition to that state law, the state law says uh, that in addition to this statute, municipalities can adopt their own ordinances also dealing with the codes of ethics. And so we have adopted an ethics code that's been on the books for quite a while now that deals with the ethics issues. Um, and you should bear in mind that when we're talking about ethics in government, <laughs> I don't know, I guess you could make a lot of uh, jokes about ethics in government. Uh, but it's not really, you know, the, the technical issue is not where, whether you're a moral or an ethical person so much, is, but rather, uh, the gist of it is whether you have a financial interest or a personal interest in whatever it is that is the issue. And under our ethics code, uh, our ethics code, by the way, is in Chapter 2. It's 2-261 through 277. Uh, this, this is, for the new alderman, this is our code of ordinances. It's by chapter Chapter two is the chapter on administration. Uh, and I was kind of in our orientation session with the new alderman, kind of thumbed through the code book so that uh, it used to be every alderman had one of these code books, but they've gotten very expensive to maintain and keep. So now you, uh, you know, you're told to go to the website and look at them, and they are there, but it's just, I, <coughs> Maybe it's age again. I always find it's uh, it's easier for me to look it up in a book than it is to look at it online. And trying to search online is not <coughs> not to me as as easy as looking at an index or table of contents on a hardbound. But uh, uh, for your benefit, uh, I've got a hardbound copy that's kept up to date of the uh, code of ordinances. The city clerk does. There's a copy in here if. You're just uh, hanging around City Hall with nothing to do, and you want to thumb through the, the code book. Uh, I think for an alderman, it's important to have some general idea, at least, what the laws of the city are. And that's really what the, the code of ordinance is. It's the, the law books for the, for the city, what our rules and regulations are, and the, what's, uh, what's allowed and what's not. I guess we have a question, Alderman Gisha. Thank you, Alderman Ryan Flesh. Uh, in our code of ethics, it talks about um, 
impropriety or the appearance of impropriety, and that always gets to be kind of gray as to we're supposed to, according to our ethics code, uh, avoid all uh, even appearance of impropriety, and 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 I don't. Uh, that's always gets to be kind of one person's opinion versus another person's opinion. I wonder how you deal with that. Well, you know, ethics codes are, uh, you know, there's no real bright line tests on ethics codes. A lot of it is gray areas. There's no doubt about that. Uh, let me cover the definitions of financial interest and, and personal interest because they are defined in the, uh, in the ordinance. A financial interest, any interest which shall yield directly or indirectly a monetary or other material benefit to the officer or employee or to any other person employed or retaining the services of the officer or employee. Uh, I should point out by, by saying officer or employee uh, as aldermen, you're officers of the city. You're, uh, our ethics code also covers city employees. Uh, personal interest is any interest arising from blood or marriage relationships or from close business or political affiliations, whether or not any financial interest is involved. Uh, as I say, our, our local code adopts the state code as well. Uh, once again, there is a declaration of policy in our ethics code that basically uh, promotes impartiality, independence, uh, and responsibility to the people. And that's, that's uh, the way you're supposed to conduct yourselves is uh, in the best interest of the public and not your own personal best interest. Uh. Mayor, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, you know, regarding, uh, you know, the, the ethics code in, in the gray area, you know, one, one, uh, one thing I've always used is that if you're stepping into what you feel is a gray area, you probably don't belong there. And, and it normally works if you look at it as black and white. Uh, if, you're, if you're going into a gray area and you think there may be the appearance of impropriety, if you don't go into that gray area, you never have to worry about it. And that's, that's one thing that I think that, uh, you know, uh, will keep uh, a lot of people, you know, if you use your conscience, and if your conscience tells you this is kind of a gray area, stay out of it, and you won't, you won't run into any problems, you know, with the appearance of impropriety, which is normally what, uh, uh, you know, things will lead to. Thank you. Before I get into specifics as to what is in the code as to uh, what's okay and what's not, uh, the overview is that the, the council in the ordinance has created an ethics board which is comprised of all the aldermen and the chairman of the committee of the whole is the chair of the ethics board. Um, there is provision in here that uh, when in doubt as to your particular, you know, uh, particular action, you may or may not uh, be considering taking uh, or whether uh, to do something is appropriate or not, you can seek an advisory opinion from the ethics board. Now, one problem is that that's kind of generally pretty time consuming. And by the time you uh, convene the ethics board and, and you're looking for some confidential opinion, you're not looking for uh, disclosing the issue publicly generally, uh, the time has passed for whatever, whatever the issue is. Somebody's offered you free tickets to the Bucks game or something like that, and you need to know an answer, you know, before the game, hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> as to whether you can go or not. Uh, uh, so the the ordinance, or there's a separate resolution that designates the Law and Licensing Committee as a subcommittee of the Ethics Code, and that's some help in that. Uh, that's only a five-person committee, and uh, if looking for some quicker advice, it may be possible to go through the Law and Licensing Committee, which uh, Alderman Rinfleisch also happens to chair <laughs> this, this council year. <laughs> uh, 
The code doesn't specifically provide for it, but uh, <coughs> as Mayor and Alderman Gisha have mentioned, uh, contact our office if you've got uh, some concerns about whether what you're doing is appropriate or not. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those things like, uh, it's sort of a smell test thing. It, as the mayor said, sort of let your conscience be your guide. It's, uh, it's not quite that simple, but if something is nagging in your mind and you're just not sure, it's better to ask beforehand because uh, while not specifically in our code, courts generally will view actions taken after requesting advice or getting an opinion uh, as to whether it's uh, appropriate or not. And as long as you follow that advice, uh, you're generally gonna be in a lot better shape and, and viewed uh, as uh, having done the right thing to get advice and and uh, the court's not going to slam you individually for for breaching the ethics code when uh, when you did the best you could. You got you know sought advice and you followed the advice you uh, you received. Since, uh, I'm sorry, Steve. Since we haven't done this one, at least in the law and licensing subcommittee before, um, I guess the question would be: To what degree is can this be done in closed session? What do we just be an open session? Uh, much of it can be done in closed session, and then that's provided for in the uh, in the code. A lot of these things are basically you're looking for a confidential opinion, uh, and you're entitled to confidential opinion uh, to uh, state to the world, you know, what what your dilemma is. Uh, uh, really, is not the way people deal with ethics issues. Uh, but the ordinance provides for and the state statute provides for uh, meeting in closed session and discussing ethics issues and things like that. Uh, the ethics board, the other function it has, uh, besides just advisory opinions, is in the event there is uh, someone brings a complaint against an alder person or an employee for violation of the ethics code, it's the ethics board that does the investigation and would hold a hearing, say, on uh, on the uh, on the issue as to whether there's a violation or not. The penalties under our ordinance, we don't provide for monetary penalties. The state statute says we can, if we want, to put in the ordinance uh, penalty monetary penalties. Ours does not, but the penalties uh, in the ordinance that we've got uh, are uh, that a violation may constitute a cause for suspension, removal from office, or employment, or other disciplinary action. Uh, so it's a serious matter. If it's an older person who's uh, being investigated, the alderman stands down from the committee and doesn't participate, obviously, in the investigation. Uh, but there are uh, due process rights. Uh, if an investigation were to go forward, uh, the individual charged, if you will, has, has rights and uh, uh, the ability to seek counsel if, uh, if it's pushed to that point uh, and right to be... Uh, you know, uh, have a hearing if if there's going to be some sort of sanctions imposed by the ethics board. Another question, Steve. Um, in terms of votes on the council floor here, um, if it is decided as a person that uh, I, I should remove myself uh, from the voting, abstain and vote, um, I also need to abstain from the debate. Is that correct as well? Yes. Uh, that's... Basically, if you need to abstain, you abstain base from that whole issue. You, you can't discuss the merits of the issue and then just say, well, I'm abstaining from the vote. You need also to abstain from the discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, abstention is really a personal thing also. Uh, uh, 
nobody can <coughs> force you to abstain. Uh, there's, you've got a First Amendment right, even though you're a government official, you still got the right to free speech. And if, uh, you know, you may run into an ethics code violation if you do vote, but uh, nobody else can tell you that you have to abstain. That's really your choice. Can give you advice and suggest you might want to, but uh, nobody can force you to. Uh, as to specifics, we've got a code provision that says no city official or employee shall request or permit the unauthorized use of city-owned vehicles, equipment, materials, or property for personal convenience or profit. A lot of these things are sort of obvious, but they're in the code. No city official shall grant any special consideration, treatment, or advantage to any citizens beyond that which is available to every other citizen. So you can't pick and choose favorites. Uh, you know, obviously, you're going to have personal friends and so forth. That's not an issue. Uh, no city official, whether paid or unpaid, shall engage in any business or transaction or shall act in regard to financial or other personal interests, direct or indirect, which is incompatible with the proper discharge of his official duties in the public interest, contrary to this article, or which would tend to impair his independence of judgment or action in the performance of his official duties. That's the sort of the, uh, the appearance or, you know, would tend to impair the independence of judgment. Uh, sometimes it's not clear, or it's clear probably in your mind that, you know, to accept uh, a free dinner from somebody isn't going to influence you, but if you look at it objectively and, and you really need to do that, might this tend to influence uh, you know, my judgment when an issue, and maybe there is an issue pending regarding that business or that individual or whatever, and uh, you know, should I be accepting that? We also have another section I'll get to in a second dealing with meals and things like that that's more specific. Uh, no city official shall engage in or accept private employment or render service for private interests when such employment or service is incompatible with the proper discharge of his official duties or attend to impair his independence of judgment or action in the performance of his official duties. Unless otherwise permitted by law and unless disclosure is made as provided by this article. Uh, disclosure of confidential information. This, this comes up in a closed session scenario. The council goes into closed session to discuss an item that's properly a subject for closed session. Um, and the next day, you read about it in the Sheboygan Press. Somebody talked to the news media. Uh, the, the section says no city official or employee shall, without proper legal authorization, disclose confidential information concerning the property, government, or affairs of the city nor shall he use his, such information to advance the financial or other personal interest of himself or others. So there's a couple keys there. No city official shall, without proper legal authorization, disclose confidential information. So uh, closed session material uh, remains closed. Now, uh, the law is generally, uh, it, it remains closed until the, uh, the need for it to remain closed no longer exists. The question is, well, when is that and who makes that determination? Uh, generally, my advice is if, if you have that question and you're considering releasing confidential information because you think it's no longer confidential, contact our office and, and uh, let's talk about it. Uh, but there are, there are certain things that, uh, you know, two years later that it's really not confidential anymore. If you say something about it, you're not breaching the ethics code, even though it may have been confidential at one time. But uh, certainly when in doubt, don't just make the leap that, well, you know, this is general knowledge and therefore I'm going to disclose what, the, what I heard in a closed session of the council. Uh, here's the big one, and this is the one that comes up most often. It's entitled Gifts and Favors. 
No city official or employee may solicit or accept any valuable gift, favor, or thing from any person who, to his knowledge, is interested directly or indirectly in any manner whatsoever in business dealings with the city. Nor shall any such official or employee accept any gift, favor, or thing of value <clears throat> that may tend to influence him in the discharge of his duties or grant in the discharge of his duties any improper favor, service, or thing of value. Favors shall include but are not limited to admission tickets to sports or entertainment events, restaurant meals, transportation for personal purposes, and providing accommodations at a hotel or resort. Uh, absent other unusual circumstances, the following actions of officials or employees shall not be deemed to be violations of this article. And here's the, where we sort of set somewhat arbitrary guidelines. Receipt of a gift that is an unsolicited item of nominal intrinsic value. Uh, you get uh, some keychain or pencil or something like that uh, from... The trinket law. <laughs> yeah, covers trinkets. Receipt of mementos such as coffee cups, paperweights, provided the value received does not exceed $20 and that distribution is of a general nature. That was kind of the uh, Mayor Schneider and Mayor, Mayor Schramm <laughs> exception. Uh, in the old days, the mayor's office had a whole Plates. shelves uh, of coffee mugs uh, in, in the office. Uh, and this covers things like coffee mugs, provided the value does not exceed $20 and that distribution of is, is of a general nature. Now, exactly what that distribution is of a general nature is, is a little <coughs> unclear to me, but uh, uh, somebody offers you, I, I've got one in my office, I use it every day, it's the cup I use. Uh, it says River's Edge on it, it was this uh, condominium project on uh, Penn Avenue there went to their grand opening and they were, at the grand opening, they were providing coffee mugs. And so it was for general distribution to anybody that was attending the grand opening. I've got it and I've been drinking coffee out of it ever since. Uh, attendance or participation at modest ceremonial events, <coughs> i.e. groundbreakings, grand openings, receptions, as well as business lunches, outings, and conferences provided the value received does not exceed $30. Uh, so business lunch is okay as long as it's not uh, a frivolous or you know a, a, a big deal. This thirty dollars been in here for twenty years and may need to be updated, but uh, it's still thirty dollars. Um, attendance or participation at events or functions sponsored by the city where there is no intent to influence the official or employee. Uh, if you recall, uh, I think at the last council meeting, you approved uh, a city employee going to Colorado Springs uh, as, as part of a uh, bike program, paid 100% by the organization putting on the event. It's tied into the, uh, the grant monies that the city got for uh, uh, non-motorized transportation, that sort of thing, but uh, it includes room and board basically while they're out there. Uh, rather than just uh, them contact, well, they contacted <coughs> the individual, rather than the individual just saying, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'll just take that, uh, we brought in a resolution and had the council sponsor that individual to go. And really that that's what this deals with, attendance or participation in events or functions sponsored by the city where there's no intent to influence the official or employee. Uh, one situation that arose, and, and I think uh, former fire chief is probably still mad at me over this, but uh, uh, the city was looking at purchasing a fire boat uh, and the manufacturer was out in uh, Las Vegas and the manufacturer, or I think it was manufacturer, offered to uh, pay full freight for uh, room and board for a week for the chief and number of firefighters to go out there and demonstrate the boat. <laughs> for a week. Uh, I told them, is you can go out there, but 
either he needs to get the council to, to sponsor him uh, and say that it's for city business, and that's why you're going, or they need to pay, uh, pay the reasonable rate themselves and, uh, and go, but, but not accept the freebie from the contractor. And uh, that's what they ended up doing is they went, I'm sure had a nice time in Las Vegas, uh, but it wasn't on the contractor's dime. And I think that's the best approach when, uh, when a contractor is looking to wine and dine you or fly you to uh, somewhere to, uh, to view something. Uh, we've had that, it seems like uh, a lot of fire issue, fire trucks and things like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, some are like to Indianapolis or something and you think, geez, uh, is that a gift or not, you know, or, <laughs> or is that a liability? But uh, uh, anyway, we've got somewhat definable provisions in the code on gifts and favors, but uh, if somebody that you know that is interested in doing business with the city is looking to give you something for, quote, for nothing, uh, or do you some favor personally, uh, bells ought to be going off in your mind that something doesn't smell right here and uh, either decline or seek, seek uh, some advice as to whether it's okay or not. Uh, I don't know how many times I got calls from employees, uh, generally department heads, where vendors uh, offer them tickets to sporting events, Bucks games, Brewers games, uh, and you know the the vendor saying, "Well, they just, you know, they do that. That's just general business." Well, yeah, but you're uh, you're dealing with that vendor, and they're trying to influence you to to buy their product and. Uh, if you want to accept the ticket, pay them the full value of what it's worth, and, and you don't have an ethics issue, uh, or decline to go. But uh, uh, a lot of times I find I'm sort of the bad guy. I get to say no, and people don't generally like that, but uh, it's really, uh, you look at it as a smell test. Uh, are they doing this because they're your personal buddies, uh, and you're going golfing with your personal buddies, or, or is it, you know, something that they wouldn't have invited you, but for the fact that you're an alderman and they've got some potential interest coming up before the council, or not necessarily with you, but with the city, and uh, it could tend to influence you in your judgment on that particular issue. Uh, Steve, I'm going to interrupt here for a second. I think the uh, the crowd's getting a little restless. I know we could talk for several more hours. <laughs> um, I've been sufficiently terrified from doing my job, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, like most of you, and we haven't even gotten to open meetings yet. Um, I think with your permission, I uh, would like to re-invite you back to cover some of those issues that you may come up with the three that you may feel like you are important to bring up to the rest of the committee. Um, but uh, I think in short and summary, uh, get his phone number on your phone and call. Uh, whenever there's any questions, um, in one in doubt, um, yeah, the, the longer I'm doing this, I think the more you've heard from me and realize that uh, he's a resource to protect us and protect the city as well. So. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm here. I'm not here to be a hard guy. You know, I provide advice to the council. That's my statutory authority and legal authority. And uh, I try to do it to the, myself and my assistant to the best of our ability. You may not always agree with this. And, uh, <coughs> As an attorney, you know we provide advice. We don't tell you what you that uh, what you have to do, and if you choose not to follow it, that's up to you. But uh, you know, somewhat your dilemma is if you don't follow our advice and it's wrong, you can be left hanging out to dry. So. <laughs> <laughs> and attorneys aren't cheap, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Use the one Depends that we whether have. In house or out house, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the price is right uh, for in house attorney here. Yeah. 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 Um, 
So I think um, I'll open up to any additional questions from the uh, com committee <coughs> this time. Um, if there are specific questions, uh, like I said, please call Steve directly. If you think it's something enough that we should all hear, let me know, um, and we can uh, bring that back uh, at a later date to this committee so that the entire council uh, can can hear, or the committee of the whole, excuse me, can, can hear. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. Thank you, Sue. Information. Um, um, the last item on the agenda is the set preferred date and time. As you may know, we've had some difficulty in setting this meeting on a day that we already had. Some of you had three meetings now. Some had two uh, on this evening. Um, the date that has come up most often, people request it, is the Wednesday of Council Week. Um, the problem with that is getting noticed. Uh, anything that gets referred from the Monday Common Council meeting to get to on Wednesday would have to be posted right away on Tuesday. That's easy. Okay. That's doable. Okay. We had the same problem with public works. It's doable. Okay. Um, does that Wednesday work for, the, at least for those council members that are here, yeah. uh, the week of council meeting? Sure. Okay. We'll look at uh, scheduling that day instead then for items that could refer to committee of oh, the whole. One other oh, I'm sorry, I Steve. Add, uh, just as, as a resource, uh, as I was looking at this today, uh, the, the, uh, party really that enforces public records law and open meeting law is the attorney general's office. Uh, generally, statute says the district attorney or the attorney general, but the attorney general deals with those issues a lot. They've got very good information on the state the Department of Justice website. If you look at that website, there's a section in the lower left-hand corner entitled Public Records and Open Meetings. Uh, and I, I looked at that uh, the other day. There's a, you click that and there's a, uh, they've got a compliance guide that they update every year on the uh, open meeting law and the public records law that's uh, got a lot of, a lot of information. It's uh, about 30 page, each of them about 30 pages long. I also noticed there's, they've got a, uh, a video that uh, was of a presentation that Attorney General's office presented I think sometime last year to the general public uh, that's an hour and a half on uh, the open meeting law. Uh, you know, if you got a free hour and a half and uh, you, you're looking to, f <laughs> you can't fall asleep, uh, it's, it's available on the web. I started looking at it and I, I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, and they've also got a PowerPoint on the, the website there on public records law. So uh, there's a lot of good information there, too. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Thank you, City Clerk, Sue Richards. Motion to adjourn. It is. Motion. Motion is made. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Chair, what's aye? We stand adjourned. <laughs>